This episode of Art Block is brought to you by my patrons, such as Max O'Shear, Mr. Eaton, and Z-Blade. If you would like to support the show, please consider pledging on Patreon or checking out my merch store. Links are in the description below. Hello and welcome to Art Block, the show where we talk about art and how it's made. I'm your host, Spirit, and today I'll be doing a video on drawing furries, talking about some of the basic shapes and things to know when it comes to drawing anthropomorphic creatures. For those who don't know what a furry is, a furry is a term for an anthropomorphic animal, which basically just means an animal that shows some level of human emotion or expression, though most are depicted as walking on two legs and maybe even wearing clothes. Now there are a few things to keep in mind when drawing furries. The main thing is that there is no one set style for you to draw them in. Even looking at examples in Disney's roster, Nick Wilde and Mickey Mouse are all drawn in different styles with different executions. While I would encourage you to study anatomy so you can get better at structuring your characters, anthro characters tend to have a lot more variety in how they can be built and proportioned. So when it comes to drawing anthro characters, you have a lot more wiggle room to draw as you would like to rather than just sticking to realism. Now, I won't really be covering on how to do bipedal anatomy in this video. I've linked my video on how to draw humans in the cart so you can watch that if you'd like. That video is a lot more suited to help you with drawing the proportions on bipeds. This video, on the other hand, will talk about more about the general things that are exclusive to furries as well as how I draw them. Now let's get into it. So the first and probably biggest thing I've seen when drawing furries is digitigrade versus plantigrade legs. Plantigrade legs are just like human legs and can be seen in a lot of cases of popular art, such as Bugs Bunny, the characters in Zootopia, and Mickey Mouse. Digitigrade legs, on the other hand, are S or Z-shaped legs that are often more prominent in artwork made by the furry fandom. A popular character that uses these types of legs is Beast from Beauty and the Beast. When drawing digigrade legs, a lot of people tend to think that they're backwards knees, but that's not really the case. The joint facing backwards is actually the heel. If you stand up on your toes, you're technically standing digitigrade. Digit meaning toe and grade roughly meaning stand, essentially translating to toe walker. In general, I've found that digigrade legs tend to be a bit more popular in fursuits, but they are just as prominent in art. I've created a diagram here to show the equivalent sections of the legs from a human leg to an animal leg. There are also semi-digigrade legs, which are essentially mostly human shaped but have the character walk on their toes. Digitigrade legs can be a bit tricky when it comes to drawing clothing. I personally cut off the pants at the ankle as you can see on Spirit, though there are cases where I have to have it run down to the base of the foot and simply have the toes sticking out. How you decide to do this is up to you in the long run, as it is more of a choice of execution. Moving on, let's talk about hands and or paws. Like digigrade versus plantigrade legs, there's a few options on how to execute on paws. Or if you're doing another species like a horse or a deer, there's also the option of having hand hooves. For the purposes of this video, I've broken this down on a scale of 1 to 5, 1 basically being a feral animal paw and 5 being a human hand. Around the level of 4, you start getting more defined shapes and dexterity, while 3 and below tend to be a bit more toony and or focus more on the pad of the paw. I've noticed a big trend of big plushy slash toony paws as of late, and while I do like them, they would be an utter nightmare to try and use as hands. One style I particularly like when drawing my anthers is my uni paw pad style. Essentially, the entire palm and fingers would be made of a soft paw pad. I can't remember where exactly I saw it or if I ended up coming with the idea on my own, but I felt that having the entire print of the hand be a pad was kind of a nice way to differentiate the animals while also keeping them a bit more human. If there is one thing I'm going to recommend when it comes to drawing more human paws, I would consider maybe keeping the claws to where the fingertips come out since I've always found it looks a bit odd to have the claws sort of sprouting from the tips of the fingers. It just looks a little bit painful to me if that makes sense. When learning how to draw the paws, studying how to draw hands is going to be very helpful, especially if you're leaning towards the realistic side of your art style. Studying the structures of hands and feet will really help you make your hand paws and feet paws look good, though referencing animal paws and hooves can be really helpful when it comes to making it feel more real or tangible. Another rule of thumb I would keep in mind when drawing a character is try to make the hands and feet as consistent as possible. Now this is a bit tricky if you're drawing a digigrade character with more realistic hands, but let's just say if your character's feet are going to have defined pads, make sure not to give your character's hands the uni paw pad treatment. Now then, let's talk about tails. A big pet peeve of mine when people draw tails is they'll draw them either too high or too low on the spine. Ideally, the tail is going to rest just above your character's tush at the base of the back. If you've ever fallen on your butt, you most likely bruised your tailbone at some point, and that is where the tail would normally be, so just keep that in mind when drawing. Also be sure to remember that the tail is going to curve slightly with the back. Don't try to make the tail sit too rigidly or point too sharply upwards. Even though most tails are made of cartilage, tails do have their limits of how far they can move. One final thing I'm going to mention is that when drawing animals with larger tails like roos, dragons, lizards, and whatnot, if the tail is bigger at the base, make sure you don't move the tail up on the back when you're drawing them. In general, make sure to keep the base or root of the tail where it is and just expand the tail evenly from there. 
Now then, moving on to the head. This is where you both have the most options for stylization, but also a little bit of a tricky spot since there are a lot of ways that you can end up making the character look uncanny. There aren't any necessarily right or wrong ways of drawing the head, but I do have a few recommendations when it comes to making sure it sits right when it comes to art. First things first is the eyes. Furry characters in general have larger or at least more expressive eyes than normal animals, since it makes them feel a little bit more alive and animated. The two major things I would say to avoid when making the eyes is to make sure not to make them too big and make sure not to make them look too human. The size of the eyes is a bit dependent on how you like your characters to look, but the general rule of thumb is that with the eyes, you don't want to make them take up any more than 33% of the face. Big eyes is okay, just make sure that they aren't so big that they stare into your soul, if that makes sense. Second thing with the eyes is making sure they don't look too human. I've seen a few artists manage to pull off more human eyes, but especially if you're leaning towards the realistic side, human eyes can go from looking really cool to looking really creepy quickly. Personally, I think if you're going to go with a realistic style for animals, maybe try sticking more to the animalistic side. It's up to you, really. If anything, consider this more of a recommendation. Next up, we have proportions of the head and the mouth. When it comes to proportioning the head, I would personally go for making the head at most the width of the ribcage. I talked about it a little bit more in my How to Draw People tutorial, but the general idea is you want to make sure that your character's neck is going to be wide enough and strong enough to support the head. As someone who has a resin fursuit head, I can confirm that the bigger the head, the stronger of a neck you'll need. When it comes to the mouth, the biggest thing I would recommend is just making sure that you don't make it too wide. Especially in species like deer and other equines, the mouth is pretty small while canines and other predators will have a bit of a wider mouth, since they use their teeth to attack prey. I ended up making this mistake with the current poses of spirit that I use on screen. Probably need to get these updated at some point, they're going to be nearly a year old soon. Another pet peeve of mine is people not drawing the correct teeth or noses on characters. A lot will draw mostly canine shaped noses as well, a lot of animals will have their own unique shape. Looking at reference images of the animal that you are drawing will help you draw these sorts of things more accurately, though some of it does come down to practice and execution. And that is my general rundown on drawing furries. If you'd like a more in-depth tutorial on proportions and how to draw the general shape, I would highly recommend checking out my video on how to draw people, which is linked in the card in the description. I've also got a link to the rest of the series of art block in the description and in the end card, so if you're interested in learning more about art and how it's made, be sure to check out the rest of the series. Before we go, I do want to talk about the difference between drawing furries for fursuit designs versus just general art, because there are a lot of things to keep in mind design-wise when it comes to making a reference sheet for art versus a ref sheet for fursuits. Here you can see a reference sheet for my character Felicia versus a ref sheet of Spirit. As you can see, both have quite a few differences in style and design. In cases of commissioning a fursuit or plush, Felicia's sheet is going to be a lot more friendly compared to Spirit, and I'll explain why. Aside from the gradient in her hair, Felicia's design is not only nice and simple, but also features a color scheme that would be ideal for fursuits, since dark fur is much easier to take care of when it comes to stain treatment and whatnot. Using simpler shapes and providing a side view is also incredibly important when it comes to making physical crafts, and this is especially important with hair. Looking at Spirit's ref sheets, little things that you can see such as how the hair is shaped are good for illustration since they're nice and detailed, but in fursuits you really need to simplify this down. Hair is really tricky for fursuit makers, so make sure to simplify it down as much as you can so that it's easy to replicate. Avoid adding too many stripes, spots, or gradients too, since complex designs can be really hard to design in suits and can make the suit far more expensive. Another thing I would recommend doing when you design for physical crafts is to keep in mind that there are limited fur colors available. Maybe consider coming up with a few drafts that closely match a fur color you found. This will help makers and other crafters better match your suit and help you become more accustomed to the look. Of course in art there is a lot more freedom, but these are just some general ideas to keep in mind. And that's about it for today's show. Last time I asked you guys if you made YouTube videos, and if so, what kind of content you made. Rocky Harmony says, An excellent video as always, and yeah, I wonder just how much longer YouTube will last given its current state. As for the question, I'm already a YouTuber, for now it's just a hobby. Creating a wide variety of content ranging from gameplays, live streams, speed paints, reviews, and some original content. But I do intend to use this format professionally when I start my guitar business. So by having fun now, I learn what I need to know to give the future content the best start that it can have. You know, as hard as YouTube is to make a living off of nowadays, it's still a decent platform for making connections, at least to some extent. If they do somehow manage to get the site back into working order, I think it would be good to invest in. For the time being, we'll just have to see if Twitch takes over. So for this week's question, if you draw furries, what are some of the tips you have for other artists wanting to make furry art? Tell me about it in the comments below for a chance to get featured in the next video. 
If you guys liked what you saw and you want to see more, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. It supports me and is practically free. Also be sure to follow me on Twitter and DeviantArt where I post artwork and updates about the show. I am also happy to announce that I am also selling merchandise on Redbubble. Get classics such as It's Just My Art Style, Bandcamp Warrior, and the one and only Mug. Everything goes to supporting me in the channel and you get something awesome in return. All links are in the description. Thank you all so much for watching, I'm Spirit, and I'll see you next time.